Walver continues, he says, confirmation to this approach about the salvation that's ours in the resurrection and in the rapture and the fact that we are saved from the eschatological wrath. Confirmation is given to this approach, this ideology, this theology, uh, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 in the study of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Yeah, where did I get that? It's because it's what Paul already talked about. That's why I said you can't read 1 Thessalonians um, 4 and 5 without turning around and reading 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's a very short uh, chapter, so just read them. Walverd reminds us, though, that it's in the Second Thessalonian passage where the day of the Lord is again introduced, this time in a context in which the Thessalonians misunderstood and needed correction because they thought they were in the day of the Lord because of the tribulation that was all around them. And uh, so listen to what Walverd has to say about these passages. A further word needs to be said concerning the relationship of the day of the Lord to the day of, the Christ, of Christ, which is part of the issue. The day of the Christ could be understood as the rapture. The day of the Lord could be understood as um, the wrath of God in some context. That's how people argue. Gundry argues at length that the various forms of the six occurrences of this phrase, the day of the Lord and the day of Christ, um, uh, and we have our references there here in uh, Corinthians, first and second books, as well as uh, Philippians. Um, these phrases, according to Gundry, do not justify any distinction from the basic term, the day of the Lord. This is an exegetical problem, according to uh uh, Walverd, that does not really affect the question of pre-tribulationism and post-tribulationism. The context, he says, of these passages are taken to many to refer to the rapture as a specific event in contrast to the day of the Lord as an extended period of time, something I also hold to and something I've been highlighting throughout these talks about the rapture being a very quick event but the day of the Lord being an extended period of time. I don't have a problem with that. In fact, I think that is sound biblical exegesis when we're looking at these two um, time frames. Let's continue with Walverd so I can finish out this part of the study that I've already gone over. If the context of each passage, along with all the references to the day, is taken into consideration, there really is no problem. This is Walverd's uh, thoughts. Even if Gundry, who's a post-tribber, even if Gundry is right in holding that these passages refer to the day of the Lord, they can be understood to refer to the beginning of the extended period of time which follows. So remember, looking at the chart of, um, let's go back down to post-trib, looking at post-trib, from their perspective, post-trip rapture and second coming are essentially the same event. We immediately, we quickly go up and then we immediately come back down. So in that regard, there's not a lot of time between the two events for the post, the classic post-trib perspective of um, the seventh week of Daniel. But by comparison, we scroll all the way back up to the pre-trib view that Walvert holds to the pre-trib rapture and the second coming are separated by a, a healthy seven-year duration. And that's get, that gives enough time for God's wrath to be poured out. So when Walverd mentions that Gundry smashes all of the references to the day of the Lord, the day of God, the day of Christ, all kind of into the same event like classic post-trib does, Walverd says that he doesn't have a problem with the concept of the day of the Lord and the day of God and the day of Christ when we're talking about one event that is connected through the wrath of God in the middle. But what, what Walver does say is that all we have to do then is realize that, according to the Bible, in the pre-trib perspective, the rapture is the front of those events, and the second coming is the end of those events. But they're both, perhaps, the wrath of God, or the tribulation, or the day of God, the day of the Lord. We could say that, um, use that language. And indeed, when we get down to post-trib, um, God's wrath is still also recognized as the full seven years, but by smashing po uh, rapture and second coming on top of one another, then we have to ask, how can one be uh, day of the Lord and the other be the day of Christ or um, uh, wrath of God and things like that? The, the, the terms get kind of a bit um, confusing uh, against one another. I think that's what um, Walvert is trying to uh, get to. Um, he said that it is again begging the question to assume that this teaches pre post tribulationism as Gundry does. 
And then he continues, Gundry summarizes his viewpoint in a way that mis- misrepresents the pre-trib position. He states, this is Gundry, speaking about pre-tribulation rapture. In the New Testament, 16 expressions appear in which the term day is used eschatologically. 20 times day appears without a qualifying phrase in view of the wide variety of expressions and the numerous instances where day occurs without special qualification. It seems a very dubious procedure to select five of the 16 expressions lump together four of the five is equivalent to one another and distinguish the four from the one remaining there's no solid basis then for distinguishing between the day of christ and the day of the lord again that's because post-tribbers believe that the day of the lord and the day of christ i.e the day of the lord being the punishment the wrath of god and the day of christ being the rapture they believe that both of those are the same event um and pre-tribbers say no they're separated by seven years so Walverd says the reference in 1 Corinthians 5 5 has a textual problem, and some texts read the day of the Lord instead of, I think, the day of Christ. Textual variant. Pre tribulationists are justified in distinguishing the remaining five texts from the day of the Lord because the expression the day of the Lord is not expressly used. Um, what Walverd's trying to do right now is kind of build a case for the fact that there's a big separation between the day of God the day of christ the day of god the day of lord etc he's trying to say that we have this wrath of god that's connecting the two events as bookends but there's no reason to simply put them on top of one another like post trippers do like gundry does so walvard says that pre-tribulationists do not claim that this proves the pre-tribulation rapture what they point to is the, that if the pre-tribulation rapture is established on the on other grounds these references seem to refer specifically to the rapture rather than to the time of judgment on the world uh this walvard says is based on what his passage states he suggests that it is therefore manifestly unfair to accuse pre-tribulationists of arbitrarily lumping things together that have no distinguishing characteristics. On the contrary, he um, maintains that the post-tribulationist is lumping together a number of different phrases that are not quite the same without any regard for the context or their precise wording. And on that logic, I have to follow with the pre-tribbers with Walvert. I think that the post-tribulationists do themselves a disservice by not giving enough differentiation between the events of the rapture slash resurrection and the events of the second coming slash day of the Lord slash Armageddon. And that's perhaps why um, they lump all of those events together on top of one another um, with sequentially the wrath the rapture happening first and then all the other stuff happening uh rap- very rapidly right away let's uh finish out uh wood uh, walver tonight alexander reese proceeds much on the same basis as gundry again reese and gundry are both post tribbers uh when he declares that all references to the day refer to the day of the lord he does this without any supporting evidence yet the word day occurs more than 200 times In the New Testament alone, this is Walvard speaking, and only becomes an eschatological term when the context so indicates. The only way all these eschatological terms can be made to refer specifically to the day of the Lord is to assume that post-tribulationism is true, and then argue from this premise, in other words, what we call circular reasoning. Pre-tribulationists rightfully object to this illogical procedure, which is uh, circular reasoning is illogical. Assuming what you do is you state what you believe is the conclusion, and then you argue from the conclusion uh, using your premises. But that's a backwards use of syllogism. You just start from premises and work your way towards a conclusion. You can't start from the conclusion and then assume that it's true and then say, well, I believe it, stating your premises because of the conclusion that you previously stated. No, your premises need to build towards a conclusion, not the other way around. Otherwise, you're arguing what we call in a circle or it's circular reasoning or it's backwards. But Walvert is saying that pre-tribulationists simply assume um, what they state to be true, and then they argue specific passages from their own uh, uh, um, conclusion, which, again, is backwards way of reasoning. Uh, Walvert continues, says, Taken as a whole, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 will not in it itself a conclusive argument for pre-tribulationism is more easily harmonized with the pre-tribulation uh, pre-tribulational interpretation than the post-tribulational interpretation. I could also add that it 
is in harmony with the pre-wrath as well. It doesn't have to just be pre-trib. The pre-wrath and, pre and uh, uh, pre-trib share some similarities on this point. He continues, Walver does, the passage is quite strange as an exclamation of the time of the rapture if in fact the Thessalonians were taught post-tribulationism and already knew that they wouldn't have to go through the day of the Lord, right? If Paul tells them you're exempt from the day of the Lord, I'm sorry, Paul says um, you're going to be, um, uh, you're not children of the day, you're not children of the night, you're children of the day, and you're not destined to wrath. Oh, but by the way, we're going to go through the day of the Lord. Then, to explain ra uh, rapture prior to the uh, day of the Lord is out of order. So, the sequence of the way Paul wrote the letters, ch chapter 4 of Thessalonians and then chapter 5, that chapter 4 contains the rapture language, resurrection, and chapter 5 of First Thessalonians contains the day of the Lord language. So, if the day of the Lord sequentially happens first, like post-tribbers believe, then why did Paul put them out of order? That kind of is a little odd. The other thing is that if, according to post-tribulationism, Christians are actually going to go through the trib, go not only through the tribulation, but go through the wrath of God, then his argument kind of falls flat as to telling them that you're not destined to wrath or something like that. It's quite strange as an explanation of rapture, and it doesn't fit with the theology. So, Walvard's bringing that to uh, our attention right now. The beginning of the day of the Lord under those circumstances would have no relationship to the rapture and would be no comfort to them in their sorrow, right? Because they're going through the day of the Lord and they're crying boo-hoo. Paul's like, oh, don't worry, the rapture's coming. Um, rapture from what? You already went through the day of the Lord. You're already going through tribulation. What, what, what blessed hope is the rapture? Other than you're just going to be resurrected and this is going to be thrust right into the um, millennial kingdom. In other words, listen to what um, Walverd says, and I think the theology is pretty solid here. On the other hand, if the rapture occurs before the end time tribulation, read here as um, read here as uh, wrath of God from a pre-wrath perspective, uh, because I disagree with the idea that rapture is going to occur before the tribulation. I take when Yeshua says in Matthew twenty-four, starting verse thirty, immediately after the tribulation of the uh, tribulation of those days then I think he goes on to describe the rapture, which if verse 31, uh, 29, 30, 31 of Matthew 24 is a rev reference to the rapture, then Yeshua un in no unmistakable terms places rapture after tribulation. But pre-tribbers have to rip that verse out of context and teach that uh, Jesus is talking about end time um second coming there when he says the gathering of all the saints the angels gathering together the elect uh pre-tribbers think that the elect there is israel and that the end time gathering there is the gathering uh, that takes place when jesus comes near army just before armageddon and so they teach that after the tribulation of those days the tribulation is that seven year slice and so when he says after the tribulation of those days jesus is referring to after the seven years have run its course then I'm going to return and gather the elect known as Israel, and then we'll do battle with the Antichrist at Armageddon. So that's what Walver believes. That's why he's going to say, on the other hand, if rapture occurs before the end time tribulation, he's talking about the end of the seven years. But what I believe is that if we take that same theology, but we just move the timing of the rapture farther on down into the tribulation view, take the word tribulation, and don't think of it as seven-year tribulation, but think of it as a shortened version of tribulation, because Jesus said those days will be cut short. And then we think of raptures happening prior to the day of the Lord being uh, poured out. Then what Falbert is saying is, on the other hand, if the rapture occurs before the end time wrath, and the day of the Lord begins at the time of the tribulation rapture, then he says the discussion is cogent because the indeterminate character of the beginning of the day of the Lord is the same as the indeterminate time of the rapture itself, which I agree with as far as the timing would be when we're talking about indeterminate. We don't know when the rapture is going to happen, but we don't also know we also don't know when the day of the Lord is going to commence because they're they happen, they're triggered one right after the other. Rapture first, day of the wrath day of the Lord second. I can tell by now by my timing that I'm going way over my regular uh, time frame for um, uh, what I would consider to be the um, uh, hour and a half long study. I'm just going longer into this. I might actually then skip the um, the normal uh, uh, 
apologetic section uh, where we deal with um, uh, looking at um, biblical Unitarianism they, based on the time frame that I'm already into. I might skip that tonight. Um, I'm having an inclination to do so. If that's the case, then we'll just finish this out and call it um, a night for the uh, live study since I'm going way longer than I normally did, would. And we'll just pick up the um, that study again in two weeks when we meet again after Purim. Okay, just reminding you. So, Walbert reminds us, nowhere in 1 Thessalonians 4 or 5 is the rapture specifically placed after the Great Tribulation and is occurring at the time of the climax of the judgments which are brought on the world at the time of the Day of the Lord. On the contrary, um, he says, nowhere is the rapture specifically placed after the Great Tribulation. Again, remember, he thinks that the word tribulation there is synonymous with wrath. So he says, what he is saying is that nowhere in Thessalonians is the rapture specific place after the wrath as occurring at the time of the climax of the judgments which are brought on the world at the time of the day of the Lord. So he he equates tribulation with rapt with uh, wrath of God. But if he is would read uh Matthew 24, uh 29 verse 29, 30, and 31, then you would have to agree that. Jesus says after the tribulation of those days, and then he describes some events. And um, he is definitely describing Jesus something that happens after the rapture, right? So um, we have to keep in kind. That's why we can really get lost in these discussions if you don't know what the person, the other person that you're having a discussion with, what their definition of rapture and tribulation and wrath uh, and day of the Lord and things like that. If you don't know what they're what they mean, then you're 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 just going to disagree with for no re good reason. And we're almost done here. Uh, Walbert says. So uh, let me reread re re that again. He says the last paragraph we're in. Nowhere in First Thessalonians four or five is the rapture specifically placed after the great tribulation, read here as the seven year tribulation, uh, and as occurring at the time of the climax of the judgments which are brought on the world at the time of the day of the lord so uh walvard is saying that going back to our chart here when we look at post-trib the post-trib rapture takes place at the very end of the seven year wrath of god tribulation of god and it happens simultaneously with the second coming we rapidly go up then we rapidly come back down uh do battle with antichrist at armageddon and then we usher in the millennial kingdom that's according to the post-trib classic post-trib position joel wrath who is a post-tribber is a kind of an exception here he believes that wrath of god is reduced to the mere 30 days that happens right after the end of the 70th week and therefore christians go through the entire seven-year tribulation according to uh, richardson we go through the entire seven-year tribulation and the seven trumpets of the wrath of god but when it comes to the uh, the seven bowls uh somewhere around there uh, there's a rapture and then a sheltering in place, protecting us through the last final seven bowls or something to that effect. I'll flash on the screen his hybrid model of pre-wrath um, with post-trib that he holds to. But Walvoord is, um, I'm showing this chart because at the end we're, we're drawing the study to a close. And then I'm going to pray, uh, do a closing prayer and then we'll call it quits. For those of you in the live study, there will be no um, eschatology. I'm sorry, there will be no... Um, post study where we do uh uh um where we do the uh uh uh, apologetics where we're dealing with trinity study we won't do that tonight because of the time i took extra long on this uh study here so, so i'm just going to use this as the entire long study um in this chart this is post-trib raptures at the far end right next to the second coming according to the classic pre-trib chart here which Walt walbert holds to and i'm saying this in closing Rapture and second coming are separated by seven years. And so, according to Walvard's understanding of the Bible, the language that Paul uses in the Thessalonian passages does not make sense if rapture and, and second coming are the same event. So, going back over <clears throat> and looking at Walvard's final paragraph, nowhere in 1 Thessalonians 4 or 5, 4 is the rapture language, 5 is the day of the Lord language in Paul. Nowhere in either 4 or 5 of 1 Thessalonians is the rapture specifically placed after the Great Tribulation and is occurring at the time of the climax of the judgments which are brought on the world at the time of the day of the Lord. On the contrary, and I'm closing, according to Walvard, who is a pre-tribber, the Thessalonians are assured that their appointment is not a day of wrath, 
but a day of salvation, a concept easily harmonized with the pre-tribulational interpretation, and I might add, is a concept that is also <clears throat> easily harmonized with the pre-wrath position. But yes, it poses problems with the post-trib position if you take that position. And according to this website, this article was taken from the Theological Journal Library CD and posted with permission of Galaxy Software. And then we got all the footnotes. So that is the study uh, in a uh, in its uh, totality. This was the rapture and the day of the Lord in First Thessalonians chapter five is seen through the lens of a, po a pre-tribulation uh, teacher by the name of Dr. John F. Walvard, uh, who has since gone on to be with the Lord. He was the former uh, president of Theolo Dallas Theological Seminary, and he is contrasting the post-trib views of Reese and Gundry, who are both post-tribbers, and he was dialoguing with the letters in the Thessalonians, and we use those because of what uh, John Piper, Pastor John Piper, talked about uh, why he holds to post-trib based on the Thessalonian passages and the wording there. But Walbert came along and um, dismantled that uh, theology uh, or disagreed with it and showed how to be uh, weaker. And so um, we're ready in two weeks to begin looking more at some overview of the four positions of wrath of, i'm sorry of, of rapture and we'll start in, uh, in two weeks with aaron eggman's pre-tribulation rapture beliefs so we can see what the pre-tribbers think and we're going to start looking now more intently at pre-tribulational rapture so we're, we're moving away from post-trib we're moving towards pre-wrath that's on the horizon but before we encounter pre-wrath and i make a case for it let me go back to this chart before i make a case for pre-wrath in topic 11 we're going to finish out this topic 10 overview by looking through some uh, pre-trib resources build a case for pre-trib and then drop the bomb on them with po uh, with the pre-wrath uh, uh, theology there but that'll do it for eschatology a biblical study of end time events